Hey everybody, today we're going to talk about one of my favorite subjects, which is motor control. Now I know there's all kinds of different fancy devices for controlling motors, and some of them are pretty complex, like uh, the variable frequency drive the VFDs, uh, soft starters, but a, but a really common way to start the motors is simply with the good old-fashioned motor starter. Uh, by name, obviously, it's used for starting motors, typically three-phase motors that consume lots of current. Uh, and to keep the operator safe, we want to use a different device and not have all of that current passing right through the push buttons and the controls that the operator is going to be pressing. Also, these can be controlled through PLC modules, so we want to make sure that that current is kept to a safe level traveling through the PLC. Otherwise, we're going to be replacing PLC modules all the time. Now, normally, a motor starter is going to consist of three main parts. Uh, these three main parts, which we'll zoom in here and take a closer look in a second, uh, but they're going to consist of a motor contactor, an overload relay, and often a, an extra set of contacts called the auxiliary contacts. Now there's a lot of different makes and models of these things, but they all tend to share these same three devices. This one's an Allen Bradley module, and this is one from Automation Direct. Uh, they both have, again, the three pieces that are important. The, o the main contactor body, this one has an auxiliary set of contacts attached to the side, and this overload relay. So when we get a closer look, you'll see that how the different properties of these devices are used to, to either adjust the circuit parameters and the performance of the device, or allowed, or they're, they're used in order to protect the device and the control circuit from an overload of, of too much current and power being sent to the motor. So let's go ahead and take a closer look and see what's going on with these components. So let's take a look at this first set of components. So this one, again, this first main piece is the contactor. The contactor is, again, it's like a giant relay. We have a coil and a set of contacts, and on this one are labeled L1 through 3 and T1 through 3, typically for starting a three-phase motor. It also has a labeled set of coil terminals. Now those coil terminals may be located anywhere. Sometimes they're on top, sometimes they're on the side. And here's two different brands, and you can see that the coil terminals are both the set of terminals that are by themselves off to the side. These coil terminals run literally a coil, which inside, we'll see if we take this apart, we'll be able to see that coil inside. This coil is along with an electronic set of, uh, of diodes. Uh, that's why this one is labeled with a plus and a minus. Not all, real, not all contactors and relays are going to be labeled with a plus and a minus. But this model is, and it protects it from reverse current. And also, uh, when, the, when a contactor is turned on and off, it generates a large voltage spike, which can be dangerous to other pieces of equipment. So these, which are often called surge suppressor type devices, uh, they protect it in case of that, uh, in case of that coil voltage buildup and then feedback. This coil generates a magnetic force inside the ferrous terminals inside, and when, when, that, uh, when that's magnetized, the top piece pulls down and that engages the contacts. That's why very often when the spring is holding the, the whole piece apart, so it's holding it in its open position, when we assemble it back together, under normal operation, <clears throat> we'll feel some resistance, but we can press the top manually to engage it. All we're doing is fighting back against that spring force. So this one has three sets of normally open terminals, the contact sets inside, but it also has a set of normally open control terminals. Those control terminals can feed the information back to a control system, like a PLC uh, or an external relay, that'll allow us to be able to make logical decisions based on whether the contactor is on or off. Now this other device, this overload relay, is a really important part of the motor starting system. It has a test and a reset so that you can periodically test to make sure that the metallic contacts inside are effectively opening and closing. But basically its job is to protect the motor and turn itself off in case of overcurrent. That overcurrent might come from, uh, from too much force and load on the motor. Uh, and there's a couple of, a couple of 
different reasons that we want to protect that, uh, but certainly safety to the system and protection of the, of the circuitry and the load is the most important. Now this one also, along with most others, has a dial to be able to adjust the current sensitivity. So at what current do you want to consider it being overloaded? Now the problem with motors though is that they do take a lot more current, like sometimes five or six times the amount of current at startup. So for a very brief time, we expect there to be a huge amount of current. The problem is if we set this at, say it's set right now at seven amps, then it would trip at seven amps, but it is expected to be at seven amps and immediately when it first starts up. And that is, uh, that, that's something that's solved by looking at this thing called a motor trip class. Now this one has a selectable motor trip class. You see a set of selector switches and depending on the position that these selector switches are in, uh, it has a trip class that's either 10, 15, 20, or 30. And that refers to the number of seconds that the motor, that this overload is going to be able to withstand a much higher current. So if we have a relatively slow startup for this motor and it's gonna take 30 seconds of high current and that's okay at the beginning, in fact, it's expected, then I would want to set these selector switches into the position that allows the trip class of 30 for 30 seconds. Now there's also an automatic and a manual reset mode. Sometimes on some overload relays like this one, this is a reset mode for manual or automatic. And we can change the type of trip that we have, the type of reset from manual to automatic. Now on this one, when I change it from manual to automatic, when it's manual, the reset button pops back up so I can press it. But in automatic mode, it's pressed down and will automatically reset as soon as the current goes back to a, an appropriately safe level. Sometimes we would want to make sure that the situation is safe, so manually reset it, uh, but it can take a little bit longer. It's a less automated system. You'll notice that this overload relay as well has a current adjustment. Now this one has no selector switch for trip classes. So if I look at the labeling on the side of it, uh, let's see here it says class 10. So this is a trip class 10, which means 10 seconds of high current before it's going to trip. Now this contactor set, the Allen Bradley one, I did mention that it has one set of normally open contacts. But if we need more than that, we can get an additional set of contacts by use of a, an external contact set on top. <clears throat> Let me assemble it here. Click it into place. Now this external set of contact, this auxiliary contact block set on top of it allows me access to a couple of more contacts. Sometimes they're normally open like in this case, but in this motor starter over here, which this one can be connected to the side, this is the auxiliary set of contacts with one normally open and one normally closed. So we connect it to the side, and now when we manually, or when it's energized and automatically depresses, we have a normally open and an external normally closed set. By default, this one does not have any additional terminals except the three line contacts for the motor to actually start. Now, as far as the coil goes, they're usually labeled with terminals like this one, A1 and A2. This one says DC 24 volts. This one also says D24 DC. Now some contactors are going to be run on higher voltages. Those higher voltages are probably going to be AC voltages, like 120 or even sometimes 230 volts AC. So why would we not directly just run the motor from the switch itself? Why would we have a switch going to the contactor? Well, again, we don't want to subject the user, the operator to those high voltages and currents so we can isolate them and we can allow it to be run from a PLC instead of just having it limited to being able to, to withstand those high currents. So therefore a PLC relay output or a DC output can run the contactor, but we don't have to worry about running those massive currents through the PLC itself. In a sense, that's why we call it a relay, but this is simply a special purpose large relay that allows massive currents and three normally open contact sets, so they call it a contactor. So there you can see all the components that are contained inside a typical motor starter. 
Now some of the things that can usually go wrong with these starters are like I mentioned earlier with the diode inside, uh, that when it's charged with a DC voltage, then that voltage can build up and when you turn off the contactor, it throws that voltage back into the control device. Now if that's something like a small relay or a PLC module, that can be fatal to that PLC and you're going to have to be replacing those modules. So that diode which sometimes is inside it if it has the plus and minus marked but often you'll just see it attached inside a the set of terminals or inside a terminal block you'll see a diode connected uh, which is used to prevent that voltage which they call flyback voltage or freewheel voltage sometimes it's called a snubber diode there's a lot of different names for it but it's used to protect the circuit uh, and so usually the problems associated with these motor starting circuits are not the contactors and the starters themselves. They're simply there to turn on and off and protect the circuit and they do a really good job at their job. So if for some reason it seems to be tripping too often or you can't get it to work and turn on at all, chances are your suspect, your culprit is going to be an external circuit somewhere, either the load, which is the motor, or the control, which may be a set of push buttons or the PLC circuit is failing to operate the system correctly. These contactors are pretty tough and although they do go bad, it's more common for the external circuit to go bad. So I hope this video helped you to understand these cool components a little bit better. Uh, they're a pretty simple set of components, uh, but they do a lot of functions throughout industry. So hopefully you work at a place that gives you a chance to be able to see these and investigate them and do it safely, of course. Uh, but it's really interesting to see them in action and really get a feel for how they work in a circuit. So like I always say, the best way to learn stuff is to go take stuff apart, go build some stuff, go break some stuff. And I hope that's what you do right after this. Have a good day.